Well, it's an honor and a privilege to stand before you tonight. Uh, Jim Young has been a friend and a mentor to me, uh, really ever, even before I came to Raleigh, North Carolina, when I was in Dallas, and, and Brad Harbaugh has also been a, a close friend, and just love and appreciate this ministry. This is a ministry that Grace Anna and I uh, support financially. This is a ministry that our church supports financially. And we believe in this ministry because this ministry brings the gospel to places where normally people like you and I can't go, to the, to the state house, to the governor's mansion, places like that. It's a, it's a very important uh, ministry, and it's an honor to, to be the keynote speaker tonight. I think the reason why I was chosen is because I was local and, was, and because I was available. But here I am. I'm available, and I'm, I'm here to, to speak to you uh, tonight. I recently read a book by Neil Howe, and the book is called The Fourth Turning is Here. And it's an interesting book because he basically puts this idea forward, and he says that America has really operated in terms of its history in cycles, and each cycle lasts about 80 to 100 years, about the lifespan of a person. And within these cycles, you have spring, which is birth and institution building, and then you have summer, which is a period of conflict, and then you have fall, which is a period of declension, and then you have winter, which is a period of death, where there's something cataclysmic that happens in the life of the nation that seems almost insurmountable. And he traces it, he begins... Uh, right before the Revolutionary War, and then you have about 80 years to what? Civil War and, and everything that happened with slavery. And then you take that 80 years again, you have the Great Depression, you have World War II, and then coming out of World War II, you have another 80-year period of spring, summer, fall, winter. And the thesis of the book is that winter is here. It's the time of death, essentially, of the institutions, of things that people love, social, economic, political. He points at the 2008 financial crisis as really the beginning of this winter period. I would think it was more the death of Reagan and Johnny Cash in 03 and 04, <laughs> but that's, that's where he begins, is 2008, and he he, and this is really fascinating. He postulates, he says, and I think he wrote this book last year. He says, I think what will happen is, is either North Korea is going to invade South Korea. You already have the, the, the Russia-Ukraine thing going on. And then Iran and China. And, and he thinks that there's going to be some major war that will basically end this period. And America will be in the fight for its life that our generation has never really known before. And as I was reading this book, several thoughts struck me. And you just think about, yes, we've been in great turmoil as a nation, politically, economically, socially, but the undergirding issue that is at the root of all of these things is the moral, spiritual issue of our country. And the other thing that struck me is that, yes, I think there are cycles in American history, but we as a nation are not promised a new spring. We're not promised a rebirth of the country. Think of the nations, the empires, that imploded throughout history, that are no longer on the face of the map. It is only by the grace and the providence of God that any nation continues to exist. And so, yes, I think winter is here, but there is no promise from God that there will be another spring. Because what this nation deserves, honestly, spiritually speaking, is God's judgment. 
We deserve for God to march on this country, not for God to bless this country. And that's why I think the theme for tonight is so, so, so important. I mean, it is a desperate hour. We are in winter. And the theme for tonight is empowering leaders for righteousness. Empowering leaders for righteousness. That we would put leaders in the state houses and in Congress that are righteous and fight for righteous things. Now, I was thinking about this theme, empowering leaders for righteousness. And I keyed in on that word, righteousness. Righteousness. What's righteousness? Well, righteousness is an attribute of God. Only God is righteous. Psalm 111.3 says, Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. Psalm 116.5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Psalm 145.17, Yahweh is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. Psalm 4.1, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. And in Acts twenty two fourteen, Christ is simply called the righteous one. He's the righteous one. Righteousness speaks to God's holiness applied in terms of government and in terms of ethics. So that's the standard of righteousness. So if you take that definition of righteousness, that God is righteous, it's God's standard of government and, and moral ethics, his holiness applied, what is needed then to have leaders who are empowered for righteousness is leaders who know God. Leaders who know God. It's very simple. If you are going to be a leader empowered for righteousness, you have to know the righteous one. There's no other way for you to enact righteousness if you don't know the one who is righteous. I saw a picture. This is a, a, a terrifying picture. It's of an astronaut. It, the picture was taken the year I was born in 1984. Maybe you've seen it. And the picture is of an astronaut doing this, the first untethered spacewalk where there's no tether attached to, this, to the shuttle. And the picture is hit of him just free-floating in the black vastness of space over the earth. Untethered. Well, you know, one gust of solar wind. <sighs> You've seen those movies. That's a, that's a nightmare. But without the knowledge of God, that is your moral life is that you are untethered from any real reality. And sometimes I hear over and over again, all the time talking to my people, how can that leader make such a foolish, honestly stupid decision? And I, I've heard this, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times, it's almost like that person wants to destroy our country. But let me tell you what's happened. That person is detached from the God whom they are supposed to be serving. And so their morals and their ethics are relative. They don't have that plumb line, that standard of the righteousness of God. And so what they need to know is the righteous one. One, so that they can en enact moral laws, but two, because by the way, guess who they are accountable to? Paul says in Romans 13 that the, that the government leaders are God's diakonos, God's deacons, God's servants to enact justice, righteousness. They will have to give an account to God. And so part of the job of a capital commission minister is not only to win people to Christ, 
but to tell them who they are accountable to. That they're there, not by accident, but because God put them there. That's why they're serving in an office. It's not, it's not by luck, it's by providence. I was thinking about this, and there's a story in the Old Testament about the boy king, Josiah. He became king when he was eight years old. And when he was 26 years old, he sent his secretary, and the secretary wasn't just somebody who would write stuff down. The secretary was basically his vice president, so to speak. And he sent him to the temple to collect some of the money. And when he went into the temple, the priest grabbed the secretary and said, hey, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what I found in the, in the back room in the temple. I found the book of the law. And I've read it, and I think the king should read it. So the secretary reads it. He brings it to Josiah. And Josiah reads the book of the law. And you know what his response was? It wasn't uh, skipping through the garden and, and singing uh, zippity doo -dah. His response was, woe is me. And woe is the nation, because now I've seen the righteousness of God. And now I know that we're accountable to him. And then he calls the nation to the temple, and he makes a covenant with the people. And he says, we're going to serve this God. We're going to put away our idols. And the writer of Kings, the writer of Chronicles, they all say that since the time of David, that this boy king, Josiah, was the most righteous king. And it was simply because he got that glimpse of God. And then he repented. He saw the righteousness of God. That's what's needed. To see God in his holiness and in his righteousness. So that's first. We need leaders who see a righteous God. And second, it's important, so important most important. We need leaders who are declared righteous. Because when you see God, truly, you see yourself. And you see yourself as a sinner before God. Paul says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous. No, not one. No, not one. There's nobody who's lived a perfect life. Everybody has fallen short of the standard of God's holiness, God's righteousness. So therefore, we all deserve God's judgment, God's wrath. But God in his mercy has provided a way of escape, and that's the good news of the gospel, the message of what Christ has accomplished, what we were just talking about, this, the, the way to heaven that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, God from very God, light from very light, the only begotten Son of God took on our humanity, lived a perfect, righteous life under the law, and then died in our place on the cross. And because he was righteous, he rose again from the on the third day so that all who believe in him might be declared righteous in God's sight. Paul who was much more holy and righteous than us, said this. He said, To be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith. So it's good news, is that in order to gain God's favor, you can stand on an other's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, because you will never earn it on your own. So the, the, the role of the Capital Commission minister, go in. This is God. This is who you're accountable to. This is the good news, that God's provided a way of escape for you. So trust Christ. Think about the Apostle Paul. He's arrested, he goes up to, to Caesarea, and Felix and Drusilla, his 
young Jewish wife call him out. This is in Acts chapter 24. And Luke records that Paul reasoned, listen, about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. And Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So essentially, Paul said, look, there's a coming judgment. God is going to judge you, but there's good news as well, that Christ is the righteous one. He preached the gospel to them, but unfortunately, they did not repent. They did not repent. Josephus, the historian, records that Drusilla, that young Jewish girl, went down to a town in Italy called Pompeii, and she was there when it erupted, and she lost her life. You only hope that she, somewhere along the way, gave her life to Christ, because we know that she heard the message of the gospel. Daniel says this, one of my favorite verses in the book of Daniel. He says, Daniel 12, 3, he says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's what, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about being a star and turning people to righteousness so that they can be declared righteous in Christ. So first, we need leaders who know the righteous God. We need leaders who are declared righteous. And then third, and this is the result of all this, we need leaders who become righteous. Because once you are declared righteous in Christ, something amazing happens. A transformation begins to take place. That when you are declared holy, God the Holy Spirit begins to work in your heart and in your soul so that you become holy. One who is declared holy becomes holy. One who is sanctified begins to become more sanctified. That you become a righteous one. And that's so important because we're here to play the long game. How do we get righteous leaders? Well, one, we want to elect them. But, but two, we hope that they will become righteous in Christ. That they will become holy. And in becoming righteous, one, they will fight for righteousness in the public square. But two, they will find God's favor. They, they're, they're his, when you're a righteous one, a saint, God's on your team. God's on your side. Psalm 112, 6, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. So God's righteous ones find divine favor and think about where we are as a nation. Think about, in the, in the kindness of God, about this new house speaker that was just chosen. Wow, how the difference that one man can make, one man can make, when they're under the divine favor of God. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. I was reading about George Washington. And, you know, George Washington, some people think he was a Christian. You know, he was one of those Anglicans, so, you know. But, um, <laughs> but I think he was. And um, Washington, at, at the Battle of Trenton, you know, that's where, that's where they went across the Delaware River and, and then marched through the night and surprise the, the German Hessians. Uh, Washington takes his guys across the river, and you know, militarily, if you cross a, a body of water, you're trapped. You know, if, if you start to retreat, you're, you're done because you have nowhere to escape. So they, they make this bold move. They cross the water, and they march on Trenton where all these German Hessians, these, these soldiers for hire, were, were there, and they, they marched through the night through sleet and, and, and snow and, and everything else because they're trying to surprise uh, the, the troops that are there. Well, right before they get there, right at daybreak, something startles them. They see some guys off in the woods, 
And, and they're like, who, who are those people? And it turns out it was a small group of other American soldiers. And unbeknownst to Washington, they had been sent by one of Washington's rival generals to attack this, an outpost of the same fort that very night. And they had already attacked it. And Washington was furious because he thinks, my whole, if you've already attacked the fort, what? And we're, we're, this is a surprise march. What's he thinking? Our cover's blown, right? You, you've already made an attack. Now they're, they're, they're up, they're expecting us. But get this. In the providence of God, there had been an American spy embedded in Washington's troops who had warned the colonel in charge of the fort at Trenton that the Americans were marching on Trenton. And so they had stayed up at Trenton watching for the Americans. And then when this little skirmishing group came and they fought them off, they thought that the Americans had already come. And so they went to bed and they went to sleep. And then Washington took them by surprise. You know what that's called? Divine favor. Uh, that's what that is. That, no, no plan of your own. That is God intervening on the part of a righteous one. And that is what we need so desperately, so desperately. We need to fund it, we need to send guys to it, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that those who are serving in the office, who have influence, are knowing the righteous God, declared righteous, and have become righteous. Because that's what matters before a righteous God. So I commend this ministry. I commend you to support it. And uh, I, I think they are doing something that is so, so, so important right now in our nation's history. Thank you.